Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Animation Coffee Break with Nelvana's past and present talent. Uh, my name is Steph Barrington, and I'm the Director of Industry Programming at the Ottawa International Animation Festival. Um, before I go on, I would like to acknowledge that the OIAF operates on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present on this territory. We recognize that on this territory, Indigenous rights holders have endured historical oppression and continue to experience inequalities. Therefore, it is important to support Indigenous folks in their struggle for equality and freedom that many Canadians take for granted. Um, our partner for today's presentation, Nelvana, is headquartered in Toronto, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Uh, we also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We encourage you all to reflect on the history, treaties, and traditional keepers of the land that you inhabit. Um, <clears throat> the OIF is so excited to be a part of Nelvana's 50th anniversary celebrations. Uh, Nelvana has been a longtime supporter and key collaborator of the OIAF and of the Canadian animation community. In 2004, Nelvana helped us to launch the animation conference, TAC, um, at OIAF, providing a forum in Canada for industry professionals to gather, network, learn, and share knowledge and resources. Their content has brought kids around the world together in laughter and learning over the last 50 years and we couldn't be more excited to help kick off their 50th anniversary celebrations with this coffee break. Um, a bit of Zoom housekeeping before we really get started. Um, just a reminder to please put any questions for the panelists in the Q&A function. Um, and now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Pam Westman. Uh, as president of Nelvana, Pam oversees both the animation studio at Nelvana as well as Nelvana Enterprises an integrated brand management company focused on merchandising and licensing. Prior to this position, Pam was head of Nelvana Enterprises, where she was instrumental in expanding Nelvana's content slate and played a leading role in establishing the company as the premier licensing agent in Canada focused on character licensing. With over 20 years of experience within the kids entertainment industry, Pam has led businesses and key children's brands to strong growth across various markets. Um, I'll welcome all my panelists to turn on their cameras and unmute themselves. And Pam, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Steph, for that uh, kind introduction. And we're really excited to be partnering with the Ottawa International Animation Festival in celebration of our 50th anniversary. And I'm so happy to have here today with us three distinguished veterans of the animation industry who have been very important members of Nelvana's history past and present. And collectively, just to let you know, we have over a hundred years of animation experience sitting here with us today among the three. And so we're gonna have some fun just digging into those years and finding out a little bit more about each of them. So apologies for the next few minutes, I am going to do a little bit of reading on, so I can give each of you um, uh, the, or everybody on listening today, a little bit of background on each of our panelists, and it, I don't want to miss anything. And then we'll get back to a more casual conversation. So let me start first with Mike Fallows, who I know very well. He's a senior director um, at uh, Nelvana and uh, an extremely significant member of our team. So Mike has directed several or numerous series and specials, including the award-winning series, Roly Polioli, which he won three Emmys, Jane and the Dragon, The Future is Wild, which he was nominated for three Emmys, including Best Direction, and Babar and Adventures of Badoo. Mike has just completed directing the second season of Emmy and Canadian Screen Awards nominated Esme and Roy, um, which has been a co-production between Nelvana and Sesame Workshop. So welcome, Mike. Um, Lenora Hume, who I know also from days where we worked together at Hit Entertainment, has, a, has a, an amazing experience um, that I will uh, read out to you right now. So Lenora is a Waterloo Arts graduate, is an award-winning film and TV executive with deep understanding of the creative and business challenges 
facing the global industry. An early start in cinematography with Nelvana led to producing Care Bears, Ewoks and Droids, plus Babar and Beetlejuice, for which she won Gemini and Emmy Awards. Disney then recruited Lenora in 1990 to join their fledgling television animation division in California. Over her 16 years, she rose to SVP Worldwide Production for both Walt Disney Television Animation and Disney Toon Studios. In 2006, she joined Hit Entertainment, where I had the privilege of working with her, and, and Hit tasked Lenora with revitalizing their preschool brands, Thomas and Friends, Bob the Builder, Angelina Ballerina, Farm and Sam, and Barney. As EVP of production, her team also developed a robust slate of new properties, including Mike the Knight, which was a Nelvana co-production. After hit in 2010, Lenora retired to Palm Desert, Palm Desert, California, and launched an independent production and consulting company. Clients have included Activision Blizzard, YouTube channel Shut Up, Cartoons, oh, Shut Up Cartoons, sorry, uh, which has 2 million subscribers and 400 million viewers. And Teamto, the largest independent animation studio in France. Lenora recently worked on Netflix limited animated, animated series, City of Ghosts, which is receiving critical acclaim. So welcome, Lenora. And third is Charlie Bonif, I want to make sure I say this right, Bonifacio, Bonifacio, who, as you can tell, I have not met. Um, so I'm sorry, Charlie, if I've, I've uh, killed your last name. Um, and so Charlie, after graduating from Sheridan College and classical anim with a classical animation diploma program in 1976, uh, he launched his early career in Toronto's Nelvana. Employed mostly as an animator, his drawing ability allowed him to migrate to design, storyboarding, layout, character posing, and animation director. As, pro as projects move through the production cycle. Charlie's career highlights include Nelvana's Rock and Rule, which is still, uh, still has a strong following, Del Disney's Hunchback, Mulan, Lilo and Stitch, as well as Stars Animation Productions of Nine, and Nomeo and Juliet, an in-house director for production on four Disney Tinkerbell shorts, and the first 10 shows of Disney's new Elena of Avalor. Charlie was character lead on Tangent Animation's new feature film, Next Gen, supervising animator on Sar Sergio Pablo's Klaus, and is currently character lead at Tangent Animation. So welcome, Charlie. So now we'll get into the, uh, the more fun, more casual conversations that I'm going to ask um, some um, of our panelists to help answer some questions. I'm also going to try and keep an eye on the Q&A. Uh, part of this Zoom call to see if I can ask some questions throughout this um, this panel, and then if not, we will get to some panel uh, some questions to the panelists at the end. So the first question I have for all three, and I'll I'll make the rounds. Um, having worked at Nelvana as well as some major animation studios within your career, what are some of the differences between working with a large studio? versus an independent animation studio. So Mike, I'll ask you that question first. Um, yeah, I guess the, the the differences perhaps are, I mean, because Nelvana has actually been both. So, um, but in the in the very early days uh, with Nelvana, it, it, was, it was such a small group of people that you actually knew everybody. And in fact, in Nelvana's case, most everybody working there was of a similar age or at a, a similar place in their in their career. So, um, so it was very, um, you know, it was it was it was such a learning environment, and um, and 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 it became sort of more like a family than anything else. And that's really a, a hard thing to to get. Uh, in a big studio. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would assume a much more relaxed environment than within a corporation. Yeah, we were all sort of learning all at the same time. And Charlie, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, um, like Mike said uh, at the beginning um, at, at Nelvana, most of us were, were recent graduates. Uh, a lot of us, uh, a first time 
kind of career in animation and and uh, it seemed like we were inventing the wheel um, at that point in in Canadian animation there wasn't much uh, um, larger productions and at the beginning Nelvan at my beginning now Nelvana started the half hour holiday series and it it just felt like uh, we were kind of creating this industry there was the Disney industry that everybody had heard of um, but none of us actually had that kind of experience so we were we were inventing it as we went along like Mike said you knew everybody half the guys from school and half from all over the world and uh, it became like a family um, for myself I haven't kind of worked that much in big big corporations my my times at, at Disney were uh, freelance working from home and um, every studio that I've worked in has been that small kind of atmosphere. And in that sort of atmosphere, you get to know people. Um, the conversations are, are frequent. Um, you, you riff off of people. I would imagine in every production, even a big corporation, you have that kind of cohesive creative unit. Um, so there's not, for me, there hasn't been that much difference working for like the large Disney corporation uh, or the small uh, startup Nelvana and what Nelvana grew into, and even the Nelvana um, ex outside productions like in Taipei for Care Bears, it was still a small a small group of people. So you're always you're always uh, uh, elbow to elbow with people in the animation industry. Mm -hmm. And it's, each crew is like a family, even though it's within a larger corporation. Exactly. Um, Lenora, what uh, what insights can you give? Well, it truly was a small company when I joined, um, which I hate to date myself. It was 1976, just when Charlie was graduating. And Mike, I'm not sure where what year you started. Um, but we hadn't even started the half hour specials yet. We were doing some work for the Canadian government. I think it was called Energy, Mines and Resources, sort of public service things. And the half hour specials were brewing. So, um, you know, obviously Cosmic Christmas was the first of those. And it truly was, uh, it felt like family. You did know everybody and you could talk to everybody. And we all tried to figure out how to do this together. Um, and, you know, we went from the half hour specials, which we did, I think five, five of them maybe, uh, mostly themed around holidays, so Easter fever and Cosmic Christmas and intergalactic Thanksgiving, which are all wonderful sh uh, short half hours if anyone gets a chance to ask them or, or to see them or can find them even. Um, and then we rolled from that into feature film. And again, it was a learning experience for everybody, including the management. And, you know, I was in cinematography through that whole process all the way to the end of uh, rock and roll and um, just absolutely learned everything I know being in that position because everything that goes wrong ends up under the camera stand and you have to try and figure out how to fix it because you don't want to bail on the shot. So it was a wonderful experience in those early days. And it grew from a really small number to, I think when I left, there was probably about four or 500 people. Wow, that is big. Um, you mentioned uh, rock and roll. And I had said that uh, Charlie also um, had worked on that when I, I gave the brief outline of his bio. And I have a question from Adam who said, who is a fan of rock and roll. It's his favorite animated movie of all time. It is a really beautiful film. So that is a real tribute to both of you that it has stood the test of time. Um, and he just wanted uh, those of you who had the chance to work on that film to share some of the experiences that you had learned from making it and how you integrated that into your careers after. And uh, before you say that, I'll just let you know that we do get requests every year for some independent film, well, obviously before COVID, COVID independent film theater to have us send the reels out so that they can, they can have a rock and roll evening. So it has definitely stood the test of time. So Charlie and Lenore, I think you both mentioned it. Mike, I'm not sure, did you work on um, rock and roll? Uh, yeah, I did. And in fact, if you, if you look at the, the disco sequence, 
in rock and roll, you will see me dance past the camera in the foreground. <laughs> One of the animators, I think Dale Schott, uh, did a caricature of me and animated it. So other than your dance moves, um, what did you learn from rock and roll and how did you integrate that into your career? Um, gee, I don't know. I, I can't say that I, I can think of anything specific to rock and roll because during that period, everything was a, was a learning experience, really. Yeah. Um, and it's a, and it's a little hazy in the uh, in the in the background there. But, uh, I mean, at that point, honestly, everything that we did, we were learning. Okay. Well, Lenora, do you have anything um, that you could specific other than the haze, which we won't ask Mike why? But uh... <laughs> well, uh, Pam, you mentioned that I graduated from Waterloo in arts, and it. it I actually started Waterloo doing a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics uh, in computer science. Uh, and this was when the computers filled, you know, like uh, an absolutely humongous room and everything was done on key punch. Um, but I loved the maths and sciences and was good at it. And I, but I was passionate about photography and dance and film. So I, after two years at Waterloo, switched into arts and graduated in arts. And it was really that combination of the maths and science and the creative that gave me the position that I ended up in at Waterloo. And it was just at the perfect time because, you know, motion control had not really picked up yet. So we started to put all sorts of really wonderful visual effects and creative camera effects in with the classical animation, which I think really distinguishes rock and roll. It is just this perfect mix of classical animation and state-of-the-art visual effects. And Charlie, did you find that same experience? Um, from my perspective, I guess, as um, a character animator, the um, the, the growth into uh, rock and roll in terms of building the studio and finding the talent that kind of stuck around from show to show. Um, my own talents in, in terms of uh, design, I, I was designing characters almost um, probably from the second half hour onwards. Um, I was getting used to uh, production design, uh, tutored by Frank Nissen, who was the main production designer. Um, by the time we got to rock and roll, um, there was a pretty good system worked out in terms of the animation um, processes. But I think what, what really marked rock and roll in terms of animation was uh, we began a lot more to share um, how, we, how we animated and, and start to study uh, things like at the time Raggedy Ann and Andy uh, was a, a feature film that was done and, and John Silvestri who worked on that would share processes about um, how he animated, how he thought about animation, how he thought about timing, how he, how he worked out his, um, his timing for shots and sequences and finding poses that were key poses. Um, we were lucky enough back then um, and I'm not sure how it happened, I imagine Patrick Clive and Michael uh, arranged for um, the the two Disney animators um, uh, Frank and Ollie. Frank and Ollie <laughs> forgot their names. Frank and Ollie came a couple of times during um, during Rock and Roll, uh, and I think it might have been pre their book, or or they were marching out their book at the time. And, and tutored us in, in their thoughts about the animation process. So there was a, there was a feeling like we were, we were learning, we were starting to, to do something in the feature film arena with um, kind of bumping up the quality of animation, trying to get uh, a bit more of that feature kind of feeling to the animation. And it was, uh, it was a creative um, just melting pot with uh, like Chuck Gamage for me was was an incredible design influence, um, and Jean was a, a an incredible uh, animation influence as well. So for me, it was it was that real trying to create the Disney 
uh, method of, of doing feature film animation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in my experience, uh, which is uh, I've only been a few years with Novana, but have known about Novana my whole career, I have found that all roads in Canadian animation lead to Novana. Somehow, whenever I talk to anybody who has uh, worked in the animation business in Canada, they have worked uh, in some way with Novana. So um, I think that it really is a testament to um, the studio and, and how it has, has really um, been the foundation of the animation industry within Canada. As you think back on, on your time with Nelvana, what has been your favorite memory, either personally or um, professionally, the work that you've worked on? Um, so Charlie, I'll come back to you. I'll let you kick this one off. Um, what comes to mind uh, just right away um, is the relationship that I developed with John um, Lawrence Collins of the Fifth Esquire. Um, John and I often sat really close uh, to one another and often went to lunch or dinners together and just had a really uh, fun and uh, creative relationship. Uh, John passed away a number of years ago and his sisters um, mailed me these little notes that we used to uh, write one another and toss over the dividers. Um, and we toss these notes back and forth. One of the notes I remember um, was I picked up this crumpled piece of paper and opened it up and it, it said sigh of relief. So John had heaved a sigh of relief over the, over the, over the <laughs> divider. So that, uh, I think that relationship was um, one of my fondest memories and, and just, I guess, the, the atmosphere and the friendship and you know, the hanging around the cafeteria that the company had built for, for its members and, and uh, just that family kind of feeling to the whole place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lenora, what's your favorite memory of your time at Nelvana? You know, rock and roll was such a long, hard road um, with sort of heartfelt memories, heartwarming memories and heart-wrenching memories. It, um, it, we all put everything into that movie. Um, and again, it just world-class animation talent from all over the world, uh, just fabulous direction, wonderful designs. It was just an experience that, you know, and it went on for about five years. Um, <laughs> You know, the difficulty with that movie was there was a lot of turmoil in the US. It was originally with MGM and a lot of turmoil. It ended up not getting a proper release, which after having spent so much of your life working on a creative process like that, to have it not see really the light of day. But the fabulous thing is, is the animation talent around the world did recognize what went into that. And it does remain a cult film um, that is appreciated by animation aficionados all over the world. And I don't think I've ever gone anywhere in the world where if I mention I was from Nelvana, I get asked about rock and roll. It's just fabulous. Amazing. And Mike, what's your favorite? You're, you're still at Novana, so you're still creating Novana memories. Um, so what uh, what is yours? Well, I guess, uh, I mean, I can't I can't go without mentioning the winning the Emmys and the Emmy nominations and all the recognition that came with Roly Polioli. That was certainly a career highlight. Um, I would say um, I got sent to to Paris I uh, forget what year, but, um, and uh, what I, I was sent over there to shepherd, uh, I think f about five episodes of Rupert that were being done uh, digital uh, ink paint composite. And that was the very first for Nelvana. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, was, it, it was the beginning of the big change uh, in our business. But it was also a significant turning point for me in terms of my career direction because I, I went full on into digital digital after that. And then on as, as one silly story or one little story I'll say is that uh, well Charlie mentioned Chuck Gamage. Well, <clears throat> many years ago, Chuck 
uh, came into my office, asked me to come with him. And we went into Patrick's office and Chuck said to Patrick, this guy should be directing for you. And shortly after that, I got my first uh, direction, directing position and, and, that, and that changed everything. Interesting, interesting. Yes, Mike is still, as I say, he is still, uh, still very much a part of our, of our world and, and we appreciate his experience. We have to make sure that we use it and, and he helps mentor people within our studio and we, we tap into uh, his experience all the time. Um, as we've mentioned, we're celebrating 50 years, which is uh, unbelievable. And I, I don't know if it's the longest independent studio uh, lifespan, but I'm going to say if it's not, it certainly is up there. Um, and I just ask for the three of you who have been within Nelvana as well as out uh, in the animation world, what do you contribute to Nelvana's longevity? How have they survived and thrived? Um, what do you think it is? So, Lenora, I'll start with you this time. Okay. Well, you know, I think there was initially at Nelvana a perfect storm of a talent in the creators of the company. It, uh, with Patrick, Michael, and Clive, you have creative business and production. And I learned from all three of them, you know, Clive, musician himself, fabulous artist, wonderful director, um, taught me a lot, you know, as I was in camera. Um, Michael was sort of our out there business guy, out there selling, trying to find work for the company as well. And Patrick was really my mentor from a production perspective. I did, um, after having done camera for many years, I took a few months off and had a child and came back as head of production and worked under Patrick for uh, the first uh, year and then started producing and did it for another eight years after that. So it really, the, the creative talent, and I mean that including business in that company, um, really worked to launch Nelvana um, into an American market, which was very difficult for a Canadian company at that point. Yes, definitely. Um, Charlie, what do you think contributes to our longevity? Yeah, I would, I would certainly echo the same um, about the three founders of that, uh, uh, of Nelvana, Patrick, Michael, and Clive. Um, I think they had the foresight to tap into the Canadian market to, to establish a footing in the animation industry and build up their expertise. And then um, they navigated the, the rock and roll experience uh, really well, but um, as most people know, Nelvana took on a lot of debt with rock and roll. But what they did um, really quickly was to pivot the market and pivot their, their business to, to uh, a more commercial, um, uh, again, like Mer uh, Lenora said, American industry. So the Care Bears movie became, or actually before Care Bears, the Strawberry Shortcake half hours and and uh, herself, the Elf half hours, kept the studio running. And then the Care Bears feature um, helped launch us into, into the worldwide market with uh, um, members of the of the Nelvana talent going overseas to, to create productions with, with uh, James Wong in, at Cuckoo's Nest and um, a, a few other studios out like that. So, so their ability to pivot and, and manage the cash flow, which is really difficult, animation yes. companies uh, rise and fall, that, that business acumen and, and the expansion of the market really helped them to sustain themselves. And then, and then I think that vision carried on that they they continued to look for opportunities to to continue to be creative and profitable at the same time. I agree. I agree. Mike? Why are we still kicking here, Mike? Yeah, well, the um, I mean, I totally agree in regards to the founders and and what they what they built and developed. But I think I think when you go beyond that, um, you know, Nelvana has always been a place, like you mentioned, everybody 
you know, in the, certainly in the Canadian business, but actually many people all over the world have passed through Nelvana and, and, and have populated the other, the other, other studios, founded other studios. Um, and I think, I think it's kind of always been that, that flow of talent coming through the, the studio that's kept it sort of energized and, 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 and keep kept it current and and I really think it, it's that flow of people coming through there that have kept it going yeah, of course definitely. of course you need good projects as well yeah I agree and, and just I'm um, looking into the future um, of Novana I think that just hearing you all talk we've definitely taken that sensibility that started with the founders and and with the foundation of Novana 50 years ago and um, just a little bit of exactly what Lenore is saying is we have a global outlook. We make projects for the world, but we have a Canadian sensibility. So we have, we're humble, I think, that we uh, love the creative process. We have great partnerships, but the, really what's important to us is nurturing that creative talent within the studio that will appeal to a global market. So we try not to be too myopic about what we do uh, from the Canadian point of view, but we definitely lean on that Canadian personality of who we are and we're proud of it. And I think that our reputation within the marketplace uh, is, is out there probably because everybody has touched on Nelvana at some point and, uh, and we get access to some really great projects to work on. So really building on the past and creating the future, I think is important too. And yeah. Pam, I've traveled the world. I, my job at Disney initially was international production. I don't think I ever went into a studio anywhere in the world where I didn't find someone who had gone through Nelvana. It's amazing. I, agree. I mean, really has infiltrated the entire world and sort of the, the culture that Nelvana nurtured, I think has really helped the global industry in the sense of, you know, not, um, well, yeah, I mean, as you were saying, it's sort of, you know, not sort of tooting our own horn, but, learning skills, both production, artistic, creative, and getting them out into the world in the business. I agree. I absolutely agree. All right, good to know that we're all in agreement on that one. Um, I'm gonna ask you to think about the industry um, over the last however many 50 years or 45 years that you guys have been in it. And what do you think have been some of the most significant changes that we've seen within the animation industry? Mike, do you want to take this one first? Sure. I think I think the absolute most significant change was going from pencil and paper and film to digital. I mean, that was that was a massive change. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, I think we're still I think we're still um, sort of moving through some of those changes that took place. I, I sort of, I remember at the very beginning when everything started to go digital, there was a lot of shows that I would say had similar looks to them. And it was a result of this new technology that was being used. And then, and, and but, but uh, even now uh, people are still finding new ways to use the tools and, things have, have gotten very creative in the sense of how we use those tools. Um, but I think that was probably the biggest, the biggest change that I saw. Yeah, yes, definitely. Charlie? Yeah, I'd say the same thing. I avoided the, uh, the digital world for years. <laughs> uh, tried to keep drawing with pencil um, and was successful in that. But at a certain point, I had to, to buckle and join the CG animation industry. Um, it's certainly, I think one of the, one of the big changes I'm seeing most recently, and I think it's, it's, it's not a change, but a coming around full circle. When we were, uh, the early years of Nelvana and the early half hours, those were created in house as like 
semi-independent productions, um, uh, design styles, animation styles were all created in Nelvana in this small cooker of, of talent. And then, and then design became a corporate kind of uh, product that you would you would take on other people's designs and, and do their projects. And in a, in a large part, Canada became an industry that did other people's work. Um, Nelvana started to change that by then, uh, I think, continuing to create their own internal animation. But I, with the advent of computers, we've seen a lot more independent kinds of productions, different styles, different art styles, different animation styles. Of course, the the international uh, independent festivals created a lot of that, but I think it's become more uh, prevalent in the industry now that uh, just an artist from somewhere can create a, a really interesting style and almost at home create their own productions. They're, they're usually short productions, but the the creativity of, of independent artists creating animated projects, I think is continuing to increase. And it's almost like that's where Nelvana started. So. It's mm -hmm. kind of a full circle thing. Yeah, I agree. Lenora? Yeah, it definitely is the, um, you know, film to digital is the largest change. Uh, you know, when I initially started shooting camera, um, every zoom and pan had to be manually calculated and manually executed one frame at a time. And at the, the initial camera we had at Nalvan, it was an old Oxbury. I, I no, actually before that, it was, it was a camera that had been cobbled together from boat parts. Um, and the way to do a fade was at the top of the camera. So I've never been more physically fit than when I was shooting camera because every frame I had to climb up that ladder, move the fade and then climb back down, move the artwork and then take the shot. I mean, it, it was very, very time consuming. And at that point, when we went from sort of doing our own productions into service work, we didn't, I mean, telex was the way of communicating with overseas. And imagine trying to communicate visual artwork with a telex typing right. you know right. it was impossible when the fax machine came in we thought we'd died and gone to heaven you know because <laughs> you could actually send a drawing overnight <laughs> um you know and then uh, motion control started so you know it went from me having to sort of manually calculate every camera move to then being able to program the camera to do it. And again, that's just my mix of sort of the photography side and the computers allowed me to have that ability to do computer programming and to, to sort of ride that wave. And, you know, I then went on to Disney. Oh, and Mike, I was just gonna say, there was one background. I don't know if everybody knows this, but there was one digital background in the Babar opening sequence that we painted in a studio in France. One background. That was, I think, the very first use of digital at Nalvana. And, you know, when we, you know, then go overseas, it's just, you know, it's just this phenomenal wave. Um, and I had no problem as an executive and a creative with that whole transition because of the roots that I had in my first couple of years at university. So I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And Patrick, Michael and Clive recognized that skill set for, I don't know why, but it was just, you know, when you think about animation, it's movement, it's photography, it's art. And I just had a little bit of all of that in my background and they recognized it. That is good. That is good. Yeah. Sometimes it is just being the right place at the right time. Um, but I, I gonna, think you I, also I, have to have the background. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Sorry, I was sorry. I, I was just going to mention that when uh, when I was working on Donkey Kong Country, which was motion capture, uh, we were doing it in Paris, and I was going back and forth between Toronto and Paris. And at one point, I went in. I I told Patrick that. I had the ability through the internet to check the animation from my desk and um, that they could send it to me. Except yeah. the problem was there was only three internet connections in the studio and, and Patrick's was one of them and he wasn't really using it for anything. So he gave me his connection. <laughs> 
And what would we do without being connected? I mean, just with, with COVID, we moved everybody, over 270 people from the studio to working from home in three weeks. And that would never, we would have had to shut down if we were not able to, you know, all plug in and, and connect um, digitally and, and be able to animate digitally. So yeah, it really has changed the industry. As one of the recent things, I think that's probably really significant because most companies never wanted to have their IP out in people's houses. So yeah. that they restricted uh, production to a studio and there's been so many animated productions done from home in the last uh, year and a half. Absolutely. Well, we did insist that we they use um, Nelvana workstations so that we could just control people getting hacked and, and things like that. But yeah, if we'd have thought about moving our studio virtually before COVID, we would have probably talked about it for a year and a half, given it a three year timetable, and then, you know, probably still been delayed a couple of years. And we did it in three weeks. So, you know, it just goes to show you, you can do it. And our animation studio has not lost a beat. People are, are, are you know, doing, we're very productive at home and the creative urge doesn't always work nine to five in downtown Toronto. Sometimes it needs to be in different environments at different times of the day. So I think this has worked, uh, if there is a silver lining, it, it has been that bringing a little bit of more of that creative um, process to, um, to the production. So it's worked very well. Um, the three of you have had amazingly successful careers and uh, we have, uh, I would say 50% of, of the audience are people who have five years or less experience. Um, and so what advice would you give to people who are in those fledgling years of their careers as to how to be, how to grow um, their careers as well as how to stay motivated? Because I know, you know, working an animated series can be two years of a grind. How do you stay motivated to continue to create as well as then grow your career and advance? Um, Lenora, why don't you take that? Well, it, you're in the animation industry in the first place. You either are crazy or passionate or both, you know, because it is a very tedious process, even now in the digital world. Um, you know, so what I found with everybody that ends up in animation is that they're there for a reason. They're there because they're passionate about the art form and they're there um, because of the talent that they have. So it just stick with it. It's it's never easy, um, but it is it is such a fulfilling career. And there are just so many opportunities not only in the art form of animation, but in a huge variety of businesses from architecture to medicine to policing to everything. So it's, it's a skill that once you learn it, I don't think you're ever going to look back and there will be opportunities in whatever channel you choose to go down. Okay, thank you. Um, I, just before I move on, a couple of people have asked how they can you know, um, get into the industry or fresh out of school? How do they get an opportunity? I did answer one of the questions in the Q&A with the contact information of our recruiter within the studio. So I'm not sure um, whoever is managing uh, this panelist uh, panel, if you could maybe share that information with whomever is asking. But uh, the great thing about this industry right now is we are all, all studios are searching for talent. So this is a great time to be in the industry um, and uh, definitely, definitely lots of opportunities. So Charlie, what advice would you give? Um, for, for people um, coming out of schools, I, I understand that, that a school will give you a, a relatively basic broad range of experience in, in terms of animation. A lot of people love animation. They go into schools, um, you know, out of a hundred, five people become animators and 10 people become layout artists and 17 people become designers and, and, and then all other um, production processes within that. Uh, schools at this point tend to, to focus your talent um, 
near the end of your your time at school so that you've come out as I want to be an animator I want to be a designer I want to be a uh, art director that sort of thing um, from my personal experience when I started at Nelvana I was hired I think as an animator but I'm not sure I didn't animate for a couple of years after that but was able to as I as I went along um, just contribute to a lot of the different areas um, design and layout and um, posing and uh, a little bit of storyboard work here and there. So I guess my advice would be that, that you, you come out of school with a broad range of experience, but um, the ability to, to apply that experience in different areas of, of, of uh, your career as you build, you're, you're basically um, uh, putting more stuff in your tool bag as you go along. And, and if you restrict yourself to one area of production, you might, uh, I, f I found at Nelvana animators would come, they'd finish a project and they would go on to another company and I would stick around and do revisions. And then I would stick around and do design on the next project. And then maybe a little bit of story work or something. So I was able to kind of be flexible in my, um, what I did in the industry and that flexibility as well gives you more tools in your toolkit, but it gives you a broader range of understanding the production in general. Um, later on in my career, when I had to keep an eye on, on production uh, footage for other people or managing um, different departments as well, it gives you a broader range of the whole production process. So. Um, just getting in somehow, somewhere with the skills that you have it being open to, to do almost anything within the industry. Um, it, it tends to specialize now with there's no in betweening jobs in animation or not m many. Um, so it's harder to get in uh, on the ground floor somewhere you have to have a specific skill. Um, but just keep yourself broad and open and continue to learn with every experience that that would be my, my advice. I think that's good advice for any industry. Get in and be willing to do anything. I think it's really solid advice. Mike? Yeah, I completely uh, agree with Charlie on that. I think, I think at the very beginning of someone's career that they should be they should be open to trying lots of different things and 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 broaden their their experience. I mean, it takes you a little while for you to figure out what um, what your particular strength strengths are and um, and what makes you happy and 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 what makes you uh, inspires you you know it's not it's not all about you have to be the, a director or you have to be an animator there are so many different roles in animation and and uh, so many different types of creative positions and so, so so people should keep as many doors open as long as they can um and then i think i think being open to change you know just going back to the 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 the, the transition from pencil paper film to digital um there's plenty of people that that um were very resistant to change yeah, and, and, no and i and and for some people it worked out fine, but for other people, um, they, they, they began to find themselves as a sort of dinosaurs in, in their business. Um, and, and, and it was difficult to keep up. And, and the fact of the matter is it's, it's, it's constantly changing. So you need to be open to the changes that are coming down the pipe and, and the new tools and the new methods. Um, yeah, and that'll that'll help you um, have a long and good career. I agree. I agree. And speaking of of changes in our industry as well as the world, we have seen over the last few years a much needed focus on representation and inclusivity um, and equity in our projects, both in front of the camera as well as behind the camera. And we have a question about that um, from one of our, our viewers um, and just 
what are we doing to contribute to representation and exclusivity um, in projects, stories, and characters in the industry as a whole? Um, I can take that one um, from Nelvana's point of view, and then I'd love to hear about how you have seen things change and, and anything else you'd like to add there. Um, you know, two years, three years ago, we took this very seriously, and we were ahead of the curve with Esme and Roy, for example, that Mike's been working on for many years, having um, a young Black female lead. Um, and uh, making sure that we could have um, different uh, marginalized or underrepresented group, um, underrepresented groups in front of the camera as well as behind as we could. But the last two years, we've really taken a focus on that and created commitments within our studio with uh, the voice talent, with uh, the writers, with development projects, and as well as uh, developing um, help reaching out into the community for incubator programs. Because what we found when we took a look at it is that we couldn't just say, let's just make the change and hire more people of color or hire more women or hire more um, indigenous people because they weren't out there in some fields readily able to come on board. So from Nelvana's point of view, we've taken a step further and tried to um, develop programs that will reach into the community to develop young talent, to encourage people to move from film into animation um, in diverse uh, neighborhoods that perhaps could not send their kids to voice talent auditions, for example, at three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, downtown Toronto, because both parents worked or it was a single parent home, or they just didn't live in that neighborhood, we've now started to reach out into diverse neighborhoods, into schools to allow those kids to try and audition for voice talent. So we are extremely committed. We are committed um, from people of color as well as females. Obviously I'm a female um, president of Nelvana, but most of my senior team are females. So we're very inclusive in terms of gender. Um, and so we have really made um, an effort. And to be frank with you, it didn't take that much. It just took some focus and some time and some resources. We're putting some um, funding in every single project so that people of color can, or, or young women can mentor and shadow um, some of our more um, experienced people. And I think that, it, and the clients that we're working with, the studios that we work with are also doing the same thing. So I think that it is a, an industry revolution, which is, which is great. Um, but I was wondering for the, the three of you, um, what do you think we could do more of or what have you seen happen? Which I think is, is really important. It's an important conversation and we're all learning as we go. Um, so Charlie, I'll start with you. Um, because I've, I've not been at the front end of organizing productions or uh, being a person who hires other people, I can only talk from my, my personal experience. Um, of being a white male in a male dominated industry of, of animation. Um, for the first, uh, I think, years at Nelvana, there were not many people of, of, um, of color, of, of obvious um, differences. We had some really uh, talented female animators that um, seemed somewhat unusual in the industry, but the, uh, the women that we had at Nelvana animating were really talented at, and did a really good job at what they did. My, I, I don't think I ever um, kind of separated people into racial or, or uh, gender groups in terms of who I worked with. Um, the experience of going to Taipei to work on the first Care Bears movie was my real first experience of actually being a minority in a, a majority um, Chinese uh, environment and and I I personally found that those people uh, at the studio were so warm and so loving that it it really kind of made me think differently about how I probably felt about different racial um, uh, groups and and talent in in the particular industry um, I think since since even then uh, my animation experience has been pretty uh, limited to um, in terms of racial and, and gender, 
Um, but my most recent uh, experiences are, are with uh, tangent animation. And there are people of, of every kind in, in every position as well. And I just find that, that um, what probably uh, is the same with any person entering the industry is that every person has a talent and every person is growing. And when you realize that, that the people that you work with are really talented in some area and growing, um, it becomes a relationship with that person's talent. It, it, there's, there's no kind of real uh, gender or racial divisions between people. It's uh, everybody's on the same team. So, and, you know, I haven't, I haven't been able to choose the people that I work with, but, but out of that, I, I have a real appreciation for just the talent that every, every individual brings to the table. I think you're right though, Charlie, it's, it's getting people in giving them the opportunities, going to where, you know, encouraging them to start within the industry. Yeah, exactly. I, I often thought that it, the, the people who worked at Walt Disney Animation in, in, uh, in LA for years and years had the opportunity to work as animators for their whole careers. And, and my career was like going from one thing to the other thing to the other thing. So that opportunity that they had uh, at the Disney studio to, to be Full on feature film animators for you know, 40 years was really, um, to me, it was an insight into opportunity. And when people have opportunity, they can, they can grow within that opportunity. And, and that's what I think um, by hiring a diverse uh, selection of people, you just give people that opportunity. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, but Lenora, talk to us about being a female in this industry and, and the differences you see now? Um, you know, I have never had issue with uh, advancing or my career because I was a woman. So again, I think it's because of great mentoring in the early days. Um, but I think until we see, and this goes for live action animation, until we see what's on those screens, whether it's a big screen in a movie or a small screen in television, um, until we see that reflect the real world, like what we see when we go out into the streets, um, we're not there. And, you know, when you think about it, women are 50% of the population. Um, there's a lot of women involved in production, but there's not nearly enough involved in the creative processes in the art form. So we need women directors, we need women art directors, we need women writers, because until you get that female perspective into the storytelling and onto the screen, it's, it's not equal. So, you know, there are groups out there. Women in Animation is a group that I have been on the board in the past and do support now. Um, you know, and by the way, for young folks out there, there's always a lot of jobs posted in women animation, uh, mostly in the US, but uh, there's a branch in Canada as well. So I, you know, I just really think we need to get to the point where the stories that are being told reflect the, the makeup and mix of the world, whether it's color, race, um, you know, or, your gender yeah. and yeah. it's it's happening because until the young kids start seeing themselves on screen they won't identify that they can be a scientist or an astronaut or whatever you know I mean they need to see it to believe it and it's it is it's it's changing significantly over the last 10 years and but we got a long way to go yeah I would agree. I would agree. We and but like I say, if you really focus on it, and you really make sure that um, you know half your development projects are half of your and and those development projects that reflect a certain group are written by that group or from the voice of that group, um, so that it's not you know a, a white male writing a story about a black female. Once you start to align those things, then I think that we will be able to encourage more people to get into and, and bring them into the creative world. Because um, yeah, you're right, Lenora, we have a 50-50 split of female to male within Nelvana, but very much funneled in all producers are female, all directors are male. And so we are starting a program to 
to integrate that and, and change. It. Right. And I think, Pam, one of the big differences is like if if like for Mike, for example, you know, Chuck marching Mike into Patrick's office and said, you know, this guy should direct. It's a woman who has not directed will not kind of put themselves forward. A man that has not directed will like, okay, you know, I can do this. And the women just need to be confident in their skills and their talent and step up. You, you got to step up to the plate. If you don't get a swing at the bat, you're not going to hit anything. So it's tough for women, I think, because of who we are. And uh, But just do it. If you want a creative position and we need you in those creative positions, put your hand up and step forward. Yeah. And I would say the same thing for BIPOC, you know, just make sure that you ask for the opportunity, go for it, get in there. I think Charlie said, just get in there, do a little bit of everything and, uh, and make sure your voice is heard. And the great thing was over the last couple of years is people are starting to listen, which is good. Finally, I think that's good. So Mike, we're kind of over time, but if you'd like to add anything to this conversation, um, please do so. And if not, then we will, um, we can wrap this up and I'll just, I'm just going to, while you're just chatting there, I'm going to just make sure we haven't missed any important questions. I do know that we can stay a little bit um, um, longer if, if uh, there's some questions here, but anybody who has to go, certainly appreciate your time here. Yeah, I, I would only say that um, it's important that we get back to, I mean, it's totally about um, having, having the opportunities and um, and so that goes back to schools and and communities and and just finding ways I mean even when we're filling roles in the studio to to throw the net wider than we have in the past um, I mean I think I th the 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 thing I worry about sometimes is that we we that we're careful that we need to be careful not to Put ourselves into a situation where we're just checking off boxes Absolutely. and i think i think the the beauty of of esme and roy is simply that the, the only human uh in that series and the lead is uh, a, a black girl and there, there there's there's no nothing is, is particularly made of that that it just happens to be and and i think i think that's the way it should be for 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 all productions right. and we we've, we've actually gone out of our way to switch male characters out to female characters to switch white characters out to bipoc characters because there's no reason why it needs to always be a white male you can tell that same story um mm -hmm. using great representation well yeah if, you, if, if there's a sense of of just checking off the boxes you know we have we have a person of, 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 of this color and we have, you know. You can't I, do that either. I no. think people will, will push back against that. Yeah. It, it's yeah. not- Pam, yes. I see Arna Selznick is in the question and answers and I must give her a shout out. Arna was probably one of the first female directors of an animated feature given that opportunity at Nalvana and has continued to direct and never had issue with stepping forward. So, I mean, there are women that will present themselves, but mm -hmm. I just encourage everybody who is having that second thought to step forward. And uh, Arno is a great example of someone who um, had a great career um, at Nalvana. And came back uh, three or four years ago and did our most magnificent thing feature and did a beautiful job. Award made the rounds of the film festivals, won many awards. So yes, we need definitely more. So um, well, we've reached the end. We're actually a little bit over. So I'm going to pass it back to Steph. Sorry for us running over, Steph. No, all good. Thank you for this engaging conversation. Uh, thank you, Pam. Thank you, Charlie, Lenora, Mike. Uh, this was really wonderful to have you guys. Um, thanks to our audience and those who are posting questions. And also thanks to our behind the scenes tech team, Alexander, Amanda, Angie, Emily. Um, this was great. Uh, before our panelists sign off, we want to take a quick screenshot. So everyone get ready to smile and we'll count down. <laughs> ready? Uh, three, two, one. 
Love it. Okay, great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Great. It's great to be here. Thank you. Bye. It was wonderful.